Ok. Este es un pequeño demo. Que This hemos... is a brief demo that we introduced in recent courses because actually in Neighbor Discovery Protocol. In NP, tal. in the Neighbor Discovery uh, Protocol, the NDP is the very core of IPv6 in a way. If you don't understand how NDP works, it will be impossible for you to give support or to reach a diagnosis, at least a proper and precise uh, diagnosis of what may be happening. So I'm going to explain live how NDP works. So basically, NDP is a suite, a suite of different uh, commands that are used in IPv6, for instance, for a number of uh, tasks, including the most uh, common, that is replacing the, uh, uh, the ARP that we use in IPv4. In NDP, NDP uh, ARP used uh, to convert uh, an, I, uh, an IPv4 address, um, and uh, now it uh, no longer exists in IPv6, and it was replaced by NDP. And NTP does many more things. We're going to try to cover many of them live with live no. captures between two devices. Estos dos dispositivos incluso ya están iniciados. So these uh, devices have already been uh, started and they have no configuration. So these are the interfaces. And now we are going to configure it in the simplest way. Once again, please, if you have any questions, you may feel free to ask them. So let's put the router. This uh, has no configuration, as I said. Router uh, in the left and the right. So N3 is a, a simulator of the networks. And rather than emulator, what you do here is you have a true network, a real network. It is something we can take this to real life and do exactly the same. The software that run by these two routers is not emulation. It's really an iOS. In my case, it's a bit uh, old, it's by Cisco. But it could be used perfectly well in a working router. So having said that, let me see router one and we'll configure it, configure terminal, enable routing here in IPv6 uh, environment. And we are going to see the interface uh, in uh, F0 and let's see the topology. Uh, F0 slash zero is connecting this with a switch in between with router two that is in the same interface. Having done this, down the interface, so let's put uh, no shutdown to the interface, at least in the Cisco world, uh, the interface is usually shut down. And well, I'm using a Cisco router, but what we're going to do here is absolutely the standard of IPv6. There's nothing proprietary here. The same thing that we do here, we can take it to any router. And uh, what will happen will be exactly the same. So router two, I'm going to do the counterpart in F0 slash zero and also put no shutdown. I'm in router two, so let's put an address, an IPv6 address. The command is IPv6 address 2001, DB812. And this will ensure the link between router one and router two. And then router two will be um, two slash 64. And then I do the same here in router one. I put uh, IPv6 address, 2001, DB8, 12. 
router one slash 64. Recordemos que barra 64. Remember es that slash 64 is traditionally the length of the prefix that we are going to use traditionally in most of the IPv6 networks. In VLANs, in LANs. In VLANs, LANs, etc. Uh, so traditionally it's a slash 64. So now we'll check whether there's connectivity between the two routers. So 2001, DB8, 12, 2, I pinned from router 1 to router 2, and it's responding. So far, so good. Now, having done this, let's go to the MVP. So I put IPv6 neighbors, and indeed, it's telling me that it has two neighbors. It shows me two neighbors in a single router with two IPv6 addresses. One is the link local, link local, that is recognized easily because it starts with FE80. And then there's another IPv6 address that I configured explicitly to the inter, um, that is the 2001 DB8-12-2. We can recognize too that it's the same uh, because here it's identical. And the same thing happens with IPv4. I may have a network interface with many IPv4 addresses, no problem. And the uh, address state interface, the reachability. And now we've seen the neighbors. This is very interesting. Basically, this is similar, bring something from the IPv4 world as uh, so ARP. So I'm going to clean this table, clear. I deleted everything, now it doesn't know anybody, and we'll do a capture, start capture between router one and router two. I hope Wireshark uh, executes uh, completely, and uh, then I do the same thing as earlier. You'll see why now. So it was successful. So. I go to the router, I put IPv6, I see MPv6. So here, let's see what we have. This is a technical part, but it's very interesting. Once again, if we don't know this little piece, it's impossible to do a good troubleshooting in IPv6. What is this first uh, packet? It's a neighbor solicitation. This packet is a sort of uh, of command of the suite of NDP. It's a, a request uh, by the neighbor. It's a, a neighbor solicitation. Why do I want to show this? Because it has many interesting things. So this is the world of layer two. In layer two world, we have a destination in this, uh, uh, it starts with 3333FF. And it's important to highlight this because um, well, today it doesn't happen so frequently, but in the past, some people thought that there might be a virus in the network um, when, uh, the, uh, when um, people started having problems, they attributed to this, but it wouldn't, but it's not due to this. Here we are building a layer two destination package, and you'll see that it ends up with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0000002. As a matter of fact, it would be El mismo final. the same ending as in the IP address that I'm doing the ping with. So you see that the multicast address in layer two was built using layer three information. The only protocol where this happens is in IPv6. This is very interesting because we know now that IPv6 as such does not work with broadcast, it disappears. Uh, so, um, this, so this is the source and this will be router one. And here, this, I'm interested in the type that is the ether type written in the layer two of uh, the mesh and it's 
86 dB, and this is very important because if for any reason the devices are blocking this traffic, then it won't work. A nivel sobre todo de switching, que por ejemplo permiten pasar IPv4, permiten pasar Spanning Tree, algún protocolo de, de routing, pero no dejan pasar diferentes Ether types. Y por eso que podemos tener redes a nivel de capa 2 que tenemos la, la hipótesis de que va a funcionar con IPv6, sin embargo luego no funciona. Aquí me voy a detener también a nivel de capa 3 que estaría pasando, señores. A nivel de capa 3 vemos lo siguiente, ¿no? Tengo, obviamente, a nivel, el, 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 el primer campo, tanto en IPv4 como en IPv6, es, es, la, es la versión. Aquí dice la versión, siempre viene marcada en 6, obviamente para IPv6. Traffic class vendría a ser para manejar calidad de servicio, flow label, tradicionalmente hoy en día viene marcado en 0. El payload lane, el next header y CMP corresponde a 58. Okay? Esto, esto vendría a ser el campo protocolo en el mundo IPv4. Algo importante en NDP de Neighbor Discovery Protocol siempre viene marcado con 255. Nunca debería venir con algo inferior. Tanto así que si viene con algo inferior, no debería ser procesado. ¿Por qué siempre viene con 255? NDP como tal es un protocolo que solamente funciona dentro de una LAN, dentro de una misma VLAN, es decir, no puede ser enrutado. Y recordemos que si existe algún tipo de enrutamiento, la función de algún enrutador, de algún dispositivo de capa 3, es disminuir este 255 al menos en uno. ¿Qué más tenemos? Tenemos, bueno, la dirección fuente obviamente es el router de capa 2, y este pedacito también me interesa mencionarlo. Esto que vemos acá es una dirección multicast a nivel de a nivel, de, a nivel de capa 3, en el mundo IPv6. ¿Y por qué es relevante? Una vez más, esta dirección IPv6, fíjense que yo hice el pin, vamos a ir rápidamente para acá, a la dirección 2001, DB8, 12, 2.2.2. Sin embargo, en el destino no se escribió esa dirección IP. Se escribió una dirección que se llama Solicited Node Multicast. ¿Ok? Esta es una dirección muy interesante, donde los 104 bits iniciales son fijos y los últimos 24 bits, es decir, para formar los 128 bits, fueron tomados de la dirección destino que yo coloqué aquí. Habiendo hecho esto, es cuando vemos que el host R2 debe estar, y lo hace automáticamente por suerte, unido a este grupo multicast. ¿Ok? Si vemos... Control IPv6 interface me muestra las interfaces. So if we see with this interface uh, show IPv6 interface, we'll see that uh, it joined the other groups. For instance, FF02, one FF00, and this. Yo por ejemplo no tengo alcanzabilidad con algún host. Algo que yo puedo verificar um, es. What I can check. So I'll see whether the remote host that I want to reach really joined this. Having said that, let's see what happens in uh, ISFP version 6. In the neighbor solicitations, you see here, neighbor solicitation, the type is 135. Remember that a datagram is uh, in what you use in IPv6 and in IPv4, it's the same. So the type, the code is uh, checksum and payload. So now, in the target, who's the target? Precisely the address that I wanted to reach. 2001, DB8, 12, What is in the payload? This here is the MAC address of router one. So automatically, my MAC address is this that. So this is how the neighbor solicitation command works. So having done this, let me uh, explain this. And if you have any question, I'd be delighted to see you. So in the Q&A panel, you can send your questions or Wesley or Jose, if you see any question. Yes, let me support you with a question. A colleague, Paolo, is asking something regarding 
the GMS visa is asking where they can obtain that information, the ISO of the router, the GMS3. Thank you, Paulo. Unfortunately, I say unfortunately, but the second part of my reply is better. But this thing only requires registering. You look this up in Google MS3, and you will reach the download site. Well, there are a lot today. Here, I included two Cisco routers, but you could put a Linux server or Windows or a device that is a Linux, but a Quagga or BIOS. And there are images of Cisco, a very modern version. But they work perfectly well. And you also have images for Juniper and Wesley. And you can also include it here. And you have Linux devices, DNS servers, and built very. I, that's why I like to use GNS3. Wesley, you can support me maybe adding anything you'd like. Rosina is asking, on subnetting in IPv6, could you tell us more about this? Because you mentioned that more most of a slash 64. Well, thank you, Rosina. Believe me, we won't leave that out. But let me finish the section on neighbor discovery, and then we'll be speaking about the addressing plan. So this comes later on. In 10 minutes' time, we'll get that far. No, está bien. Adelante. Voy ayudando ahí junto con el compañero. Muchas gracias. Vale, mil gracias entonces. Thank you. Y me encantan las preguntas. Por favor, siéntanse libres de realizarlas. Es muy importante. So I love getting questions and okay. Having seen the neighbor solicitation, let us see at the answers. What happened? A router two. Router one. Quieren hacer router two. This wanted to reach out to router two. So they sent a packet. Positivo. ¿Quién tiene tal IP? R2 la tiene. Vamos a ver qué respuesta. Who has this IP? The response is neighbor advertisement. Muy breve. Lo vas a pasar un poco más rápido que el anterior. So, very briefly, I'm going to show it faster. The origin and destination in layer two, they are absolutely unicast. The uh, answers are always unicast. So, here, this is IPv6. So the rest is maintained, and here too. And this is an interesting thing. How can router one be sure as to what is the MAC address of uh, router two? Thanks to this little part, the payload, the payload of uh, of uh, um, uh, version six uh, indicates uh, the MAC address. If I use this, I see this MAC address, it should correspond to that of IPv6. So briefly. Okay. My apologies uh, for taking you up and down. It should be this one here. This one should uh, match this other one. That is 021FA30000. So router one connects a uh, with router two, everything that is a neighbor discovery with uh, IPv6, this is the MAC address. So this is the way it works. So now there are other commands for example, duplicate address detection. So, as uh, in the part of route advertisement, uh, you can take it with a uh, word chat that um, is uh, free of charge and it exists in almost all the OSs. So, 
Having seen all this, I'll go back to the presentation. Que me que es sobre I, esto. I, there's another part that I'd like to tell you about, and it's about uh, the uh, uh, plan. Uh, what has happened in the uh, routing plan? What has happened in the IPv4 and IPv6 world? Well, you know that an IPv4 uh, has, uh, address has this format. If I take it today, in most cases, I have eight bits, eight bits, eight bits, eight bits. So overall, I have 32 IPv4 bits. Alejandro, yes, can I interrupt you? There is somebody, Andres, is, who's asking whether you could very quickly explain the difference of broadcasting with IPv4 and uh, uh, while IPv6 uses uh, broadcast, uh, multicast. Could you explain that, the difference between broadcast and multicast? Yes, yes, please. Uh, um, uh, you are invited to ask questions, really. Uh, I prefer if you ask the questions. In the IP world, there are four types of transmission, unicast, broadcast, multicast, and anycast. In unicast, basically, we are speaking that one transmits to one. So that's the most common thing. So I, I give a package to Google and they send one to me, etc. That is what we call unicast. There you are, unicast. And the other thing is multicast. Multicast as such is very interesting. Imagine a classroom and I divide that classroom into four colors. Let's see, I, let's say I have 20 students, four groups with five people each. They, there's no need for it to be the same number of people. Uh, I, one of them is yellow, another is green, red, blue. So multicals transmit just one packet and um, it's going to be received by all by the blue group. So if in the blue group there were seven people, I don't have to transmit seven. So the entire blue group is going to be able to read it. Multicast traditionally is much, much more efficient than broadcast because of many reasons that I'm going to explain now. One of them uh, is how many packages uh, transit through the network. Imagine that I am uh, connected to a switch with 24 ports. I transmit a package and it will be received by the switch and the broker will transmit it to the other 23 ports in multicast the switch will know who is in which multicast group. And let's say that I transmitted it to the blue group where there were seven people. The switch will receive my packet uh, that was going to the blue group uh, and they are only, it's only going to send it to the seven PCs that were connected to the blue group. So in this case, we save the 16 ports. Now, what are the other advantages we have, namely processing? Each of the devices that receive the packet are the ones that are going to be processing this. It's not the 23 additional devices that are going to process the packet. So we can see very clearly that multicast is saves much more and is far more efficient in this network world. Yes, there is an image in the WhatsApp that illustrates this issue of the multicast. And maybe we can share that on the screen. Well, this is remote support. Thank you, Wesley. Real time support. Okay, wonderful. So Wesley, maybe you can help me explain this sketch. Thank you. Well, this image shows more about what Alejandro was explaining regarding the multicast group and the difference to broadcast. This would have a greater load of all the hosts. So all the hosts would be receiving the same packets sent through broadcast. And this is what 
Ali explained the issue of multicast. So only those that are part of this group are the ones that will be receiving the packets. And this is a difference. If you do neighbor discovery, then this is done through a multicast group, which includes all the hosts of a given network. But if you do this a solicitation to discover a router, then this is only the multicast group to the routers. So only those routers that are in the multicast group are going to receive these packets. And that is where there is a better flow in the network. So many packets stop going through the network towards. So this is an enormous saving in traffic and in resources. Thank you very much for this real-time explanation, Wellesley. Great. So let us now go back to the presentation. And we see how it changed from IPv4 to IPv6 in order to understand better. So. It's good that this changed. In the past, the 32 bits did not have any margin to work easily and better on my subnetting. Now, fortunately, we have 128 bits. So let us continue so we can see how wonderful this all is. And let me remind you that by default, the ISPs receive a slash 32. All the ISPs in Latin America receive as a minimum slash 32 network. It can, be, it can even be larger than this. Now, what does this mean? If I take this to the, all the subnets that normally, that traditionally are created in IPv6 world, it means that any ISP in the region has as a minimum the slice of this one here. And I dare to say something else. In the world of a 34 IPv4 bits, I do not use the 2 to the 32, the 32nd. So any ISP in the region has at least the size of the current internet. And I always like to recall that the conservationist mentality we have. So in IPv4, we have the mentality that we want to save IP addresses. In the IPv6 world, we really have to change that mindset. We have to go to the concept that IPv6 addresses will not run out. It's like all the stars in the universe. And this is something that a friend of us uh, stated, Tom Caffin. He was with us in several webinars. And he uh, had a, wrote a book called IPv6 Address Plan. And the people who like to no me gusta find esta parte uh, people to blame, well, for example, I respect Dr. Vinsurf immensely, but Dr. Vinsurf also takes on the responsibility because he says there are 32 bits in the IPv4 world. This is what he says. And Dr. Vinsurf is considered the father of the internet. Alejandro, sorry to interrupt. A couple of questions on the previous segment. Could you speak more about spoofing and neighbor and the neighbor discovery protocol? Fabio is asking us about that. And I'm going to ask the three questions together. So the difference between the linked local and global addresses and the issue of IGMP in IPv6 in the sense of the version that is being used. So when you answer, maybe we can help you out. Great. Regarding spoofing, there are two things at the level of spoofing that I can think of now. One is a well-known attack. The two are replications of IPv4, and this can be to the following. So what would be happening here if I connect a switch here in the middle? I'm going to do this very rapidly.
Con este dibujito lo vamos a explicar hasta, hasta So with this sketch I'm going to explain this much faster. ¿Qué estaría pasando acá? So what would be happening here? And probably you're referring to something on security. This R1, which is to reach R2. If we recall how NDP works, we're going to realize that these are packets in clear text. And this is a typical attack that also exists in IPv4. It might happen that this router here comes in and makes up as if it would be router 2. So it, it's going to spoof the MAC address and the neighbor advertisements of this guy to R1. And R1, when sending this to R2, is going to send it to R3. How was this spoofed? R3 told R1 that the IP address of R2, the MAC address of R2 was also here in R3. I can capture this in promiscuous mode. And when I want R1 wishes to send the packet to R2, the switch is going to switch it at the MAC address level. It's going to see the MAC address of destination, which theoretically is here. So it's going to go in this direction. And this R3 can capture all the R1 packets, all the packets that R1 is trying to send to R2. And then the, in the opposite direction as well, the packets sent by R2 are going to be captured by R3. So. Basically, they ask who has the address, and I can also spoof that kind of answer. And the other question was the link local address. In theory, there are several types of addresses. The most common ones are ULA, unique local address, which is the evolution of an address that no longer exists. And then the other two, which we have right now, With this command, I'm going to show this better. Show IPv6 interface. And uh, we'll show IPv6 interface. I see which the interfaces are the interfaces that have IPv6. Here I have a link local. Link locals are addresses. The name is quite explicit. These addresses that only have the scope within the link. These IP addresses cannot be routed. A router should not route one of these addresses. It has a cancel link command. So it is within the VLAN and the SSID. And we also have the global addresses. The global addresses are the IPv6 addresses that we can most compare with the public IPv4 addresses. When someone speaks about public IPv6 addresses, this doesn't exist. And if someone is speaking of this, they're referring to the global addresses. They are the IP addresses that can reach any part of the internet. I can also reach us. These are IP addresses that can be routed in the internet. These are IP addresses that through VGP, the providers should not drop. The link local is easily identified because it begun, begins with FE80, a global address. All the global addresses, October 2020, are going to start with 2,000 or 3,000. This is because this is the numbering that was approved by IANA. And we have the IGMP part. Wesley, are you going to support me with this, or shall I go on? The a... other question was regarding IGMP. Yes. This is a very interesting question. IGMP is a protocol, intergroup, internet group message protocol. So this means that an IP4 can do join and, and join a grouping. Multicast is associated to groups when I wish to convey information to groups. So this multicast process exists both in IPv4 at level of layer 3. 
in level two, it's broadcast in IPv6. The multicast concept also happens at level two. Alejandro explained there are some MAC address addresses of multicast features, but this also happens in IPv6 version three. But when Alejandro was speaking about multicast process in IPv6, he was referring to the layer two process and the layer three process. So the association of a host in layer two and layer three to a multicast group is native. Therefore, it does not require, in terms of NDP protocol, it does not require a secondary protocol to become associated or not associated to this. Alejandro, could you show us the IP address that the device has in the interface natively? and that makes it belong to this group. If you show us that, we see that the IGMP protocol is not required in NDP, but it is if it is multicast for transmission, for streaming, then you do need the IGMP that in IPv6 has a variant that is MLD. So Alejandro, could you please show us the addresses where you see join net group address, joint group addresses. So, it does a listing here natively and doesn't doesn't require an alternative protocol to become associated or disassociated. In IPv6, the devices not only listen through the link local address, but also through the multicast IP addresses to which it belongs. I hope with this, I was able to clarify further. Thank you. Thank you for that ex explanation and was, as was mentioned, in other protocols, the multicast part is very important and something we have in our everyday work. So thank you very much for your explanation. Continue asking your questions. I have seven minutes left. Let us see if we can explain prefix links. I wanted to explain that the frequent prefixes are normally a slash 64. This is the one that is most used. Then we have loopback addresses, and this strongly depends on the taste of the person. And I am including here this, but there can be also others if you might wish to use a slash 120. And that is also allowed. But normally we can use in the slash 128. So in the IPv4 world, I could use a slash 34. Point to point, normally slash 64 is used. Sometimes people use slash 64 and they reserve this, but in the interface, they configure it as a slash one to seven. In the IPv6 world, we use this. Alejandro, you are speaking about addressing, and we have a couple of questions regarding this. And for example, on NAT and so on. They're asking how this would happen in the case of IPv6 regarding security issues and the addressing behind those devices. And if you have UA, uh, options. So maybe you can explain this further. Okay. Uh, el tema de NAT. So the issue about NAT, to be frank, what is happening in the world is that this has decreased about 98%. But NAT exists. It is viable. And in, I can, in IPv6, I can do nothing in, I, in 60, not 66, in IPv6. The major vendors are using it, and Linux supports this and has done so for quite a number of years. So yeah, you can do NAT in the IPv6 world. Now, there's an additional concept, which is NPT, which is Network Prefix Translation. It's like a NAT. But instead of natting the entire IP address, I also do natting with a prefix. For example, if I have a slash 64, I'm just going to nat the prefix of the network, not the entire address. And this is most interesting. 
Mm -hmm. And it works perfectly well. And it is also supported in the Linux world. I have a couple of blogs, and I have explained how this works. Now, briefly, regarding the GUA security, GUA is Global Unicast Address. Basically, the IP addresses would be more exposed in today's world because we don't have NAT. People where IPv6 has been deployed in the GUA, the mobile phones, and so on. So having said this, NAT66 and NAT44 give some impression of security. But if we speak with the majority of experts on security, they're not going to agree with the fact that NAT6 is a security mechanism. A security mechanism, in fact, are those devices, for example, firewalls, that do some kind of stateful activity, namely they maintain the status of the connection of a device. For example, if in my computer or my mobile phone, I open google.com, then the packet should be a TCP packet with the origin and destination address, and this maintains a transit status in the network. So having said this, the logical thing is that all the devices go through this world. There is a very interesting group in the IETF called HomeNet, which and the routers in the homes all do this. And they all come with the incoming connections and they won't reach my devices because any routing device simply are going to drop this and they won't reach my device, which has a GUA. Any other things? So I reach the end of this presentation. It's already posted in the internet. It's in the website. Uh, Alejandro, a couple of things. They're asking, I'm, I'm trying to summarize a number of questions to, for the sake of time. The issue of assigning slash 64 its usage and whether it improves the efficiency of using a slash uh, 64 end to end or rather than 124. 26. Uh, well, slash 64, it's important to point out when it's going to be used. We've said that it is the most frequent, that is the one that we are going to use more often. Why? The reason is because of the mechanisms that are implicit in IPv6 that en enable you, among many things, for instance, to self-configure. If I take a network, a LAN network of my at home, and I put something smaller than a slash 64, the devices will be, uh, you. I won't be able to configure the devices because of many reasons. There's a whole story behind it. But so, the self-configuration, it requires an AU64, a mechanism that took uh, the MAC address of a, uh, uh, 48 uh, bits, and in a way, it built it, it added an FFE, so, and it added interface 6D. That is the last uh, 64 bits of an IPv6 address. So what happens if I use something smaller, the mechanism would fail. And the good thing about uh, IPv6 is the part of configuration. We won't need HTTP. So it, it, it's better to le, le, leave a, a slash 64. I can use smaller if it's point to point. Perfectamente. Uh, 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 Jose read. It could be a, a slash 27, 127. What is the advantage of a slash 127? There should be no attacks. And 
Como que yo no I quiero don't usar... want you to see it as if I were trying to save the addresses, because uh, it, that's the way the mindset that we had with IPv4. Several experts have tried to estimate when IPv6 addresses are rotated, because it's a very valid question. If the IPv4 addresses were depleted, then the same thing might happen with IPv4. Uh, if IPv4 was depleted, then the same thing might happen with IPv6. But it is estimated that for around the year 200,000. So, uh, today, the, we estimate that IPv6 addresses won't be depleted until the year 200,000. So if that's not the reason why not we are not using uh, slash 64. Let me add to your answer because there are aspects such as privacy addresses and also efficiency in the routing tables, not having so small prefixes, 127, 126, because those are additional elements to be considered that uh, make a slash 64 much better. But in addition to that, I have a question here that's very interesting. Uh, about what you just said about uh, the identity theft uh, with the two routers that you have in the topology here. The question is whether there's any way you can avoid that. Are there any devices that detect that and that may, um, that, so that the networks in the the nodes in the network that are that address theft may uh, find out that, that that is happening and do something about it. What actions could I take for safeguard? Well, let's answer that. Well, well, let's leave the questions until later. We'll have a five minute break and I commit myself to answering the questions that uh, were left in the Q&A box. I'd be very happy to answer them. And I'll leave you my email address too, if you want to contact me. So let's... Uh, that's an excellent question. And in LACNIC, from LACNIC, we always promote the deployment of IPv6. However, we want to disseminate it in a safe manner. So that's why your question is so important. So what do we do? The mechanisms that we are going to implement are very similar in IPv4 and IPv6. So the question is, how can I prevent this gentleman to capture or to uh, uh, steal the identity of one of these? In IPv4, what I can force a MAC address to an IPv4 address. I can do exactly the same as in the IPv6 world. In the device, in the switch, I can explicitly indicate what MAC address uh, I have and in which ports. So if this gentleman wants to impersonate this other one, he won't succeed. Or at least 50% of identity thefts, that's what happens. And there are other things that are not precisely in this attack, but today with the modern switches, uh, that is the, those developed uh, within five years, they bring another very interesting mechanism. I can use the routing, routing advertising, the RAs. I can use a switch here, I connect a router, and it will only allow packages from here to here. The router for aquí, perdón, por otro and if puerto. there's here, a package comes in uh, this router, it will be dropped. It's very similar to what would happen with HTTP in the IPv4 world. I, I'm, I can uh, limit the ones that I want in. So, and the same thing applies to IPv6. So I think that those are the mechanisms to avoid the impersonation 
at uh, the layer two in the switch. I think I'm not missing anything. So it would be forcing the two devices. And you could say, for instance, well, this MAC address is associated to this IPv6 uh, address. So you can ignore the packets that are not coming from, the packages that are not coming from here. And once again, in the switch, I see which MAC address is connected to uh, which ports. So now let's uh, have a, a brief break. It's uh, four to uh, the hour. So we'll be back in five minutes. And then you would, Wesley, you will continue with the next uh, session, right? And I'll answer the questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see it well? Yes, we can see it well. So thank you all for coming to LACNIC 34 online. It's a very interesting event. And uh, we're going to talk about a transition for IPv4 in dual stack. Um, uh, going on with uh, the tutorials uh, for IPv6. Let me tell you who I am. I'm Wesley um, Correa. I'm a, a telecom consultoria, entretenimiento y servicios. That's a Paraguayan company for training advice uh, um, and best practices for ISPs in Latin America. And I'm a vice president of Brazil Peering Forum, a group of professionals who has worked for the development of the internet in Brazil. And I'm also one, the creator of ISPPY, that is the annual event uh, for ISPs in Paraguay. And I work a lot uh, exchanging information, uh, events. I'm always there trying to contribute uh, to the extent possible for our LACNIC community. So let's talk about the transition from IPv4 to IPv6 using dual stack. Earlier, we discussed what the transition would be like. So based on some definitions, the word transition uh, elicits the idea of uh, changing from one status to another. And this is something that we learn since we are children, that it is going from the pupa to the uh, uh, to, to the butterfly. So there's a period here in the transition where we don't have any larvae or any butters, uh, or the butterflies because we are in the transition. What does that have to do with IPv4 and IPv6? Well, because when we're speaking of transition, the two are stuck would be the te technique to uh, as a transition for a soft landing from IPv4 to IPv6. In this case, it is you need to have the two IP stacks in all the hosts, all the devices, so that all the devices may have access to everything that the internet provides, either in IPv4 or in IPv6. So, like it or not, you need to have enough IPv4 addresses if you are to de deploy that. So here we are speaking of IPv4 addresses. We are not uh, saying whether they're public or private with carry a NAT. So you need to have addresses regardless of whether they are public or private with CG NAT. This is a sketch by LACNIC that shows how a connection works in dual stack when the destination is IPv4 and when it's IPv6. It looks very simple. When the destination is IPv4, we leave with IPv4, and when it's IPv6, then it leaves in IPv6. Now, what if the destination has the two? What if we are going to access a website that has the two IP addresses, both IPv4 and IPv6 that are ready and with a connectivity as a, uh, requested. So RFC 6555 and RFC 8305 um, uh, describe the happy eyeballs. What, does, what do the happy eyeballs do? If the destination has the two 
IP stacks, then the two packages uh, leave, but the IP6 one leaves a bit earlier. And there we are going to have, based on uh, this image, here you have the host, the device of the client that sends a query to a certain domain that is it wants to receive the answer for the entry A for a certain domain and then the um, well, four A's and here you have the quad A, A, here you have one, this is for IPv4 and uh, 2001 DB8, uh, one that is for IPv6 and with the two addresses uh, in my smartphone or tablet or computer, whatever. Now we are going to open the connection. So and this is done sending the two TCP saying uh, packages of IPv6 a bit earlier and then IPv4. That is, if we receive the, uh, the response of uh, saying IPv6 earlier, then you establish the connection in IPv6. However, if the IPv6 uh, package gets lost and if it's configured in the, the server in the Linux, but it's not uh, Nginx or, or any other web service or any other app, then we won't have responses to this request. So the package gets lost. We are going to have the IPv4 response and automatically we are going to open the connection with IPv4. So from the uh, client's side, from the host side, you don't see any delays. You don't perceive any difficulties. Everything is absolutely transparent and seamless for the user. So here we understand uh, how that works from the side of the user. Our, t our tutorial speaks of the PPPoE. And there we have a, a capture a, uh, uh, that shows how it you work with the dual stack. Based on uh, our addressing plan, we are going to define the uh, tunnel pool and the prefix delegation pool. What are they? Well, the tunnel pool is what is used by the PPPoE session. That is when the client connects automatically, the pool tunnel is going to be used by the host. If we are doing the PPPoE uh, connection in a computer, that will ensure that the computer will have internet connection in IPv6. If we are doing the PPPoE uh, from a router or any other device that uses the routing, this pool will almost not be used. Some ISPs require it and others don't. That is why they recommend, it, they recommend to always set the tunnel pool. And what does the pool, uh, the prefix delegation pool for? It will be delivered in the internal domain of the user. Let's assume, for instance, that we have two antennas for LAN port and uh, it wants to uh, uh, to send the IPv4 block. It won't be the slash 64 because as Alejandro said, 64 is only for one segment of the network. So what do we do? We provide a 56 that will give uh, the client the flexibility of having multiple network domains at home. What do we need that for? Why don't we just uh, deliver a slash 64? Because we're looking into the future. So as uh, as Ali said, we cannot save I, uh, IPv6 because uh, it uh, came here to solve a number of problems that we already had with IPv4. One of them is the end-to-end -end connection between the devices. That is, if we have IPv6, it will no longer be necessary to redirect uh, uh, the port for a camera or whatever. So it gives us the possibility for having multiple networks. So the QS prioritizes 
the, the, the traffic is no longer prioritized by the type of uh, the class of traffic. We can define a slash 64 for our security network, for instance, and you have all the cameras, the sensors, the gate, alarms, everything is going to be in this slash 64 segment that will have the priority for transmitting data. And it won't have any interference of another slash 64 that we may be using for games, for instance. So you always have to So I always am asked, I already did that, I already did that configuration, but the CPE doesn't pick up the DNS, IPv6 doesn't pick up, only picks up the IPv4 DNS, and many even say, well, I tried to, to disable IPv4 from my network and it didn't work. And I only think that the DNS from Google and so on, but I couldn't solve this. And this is because you have to announce your DNS. And for the micro tick, you have to fill in the space of the DNS in the DNS settings menu. The DNS is for IPv6 and for IPv4. And then see this circle here, allow remote requests. Please never ever click that box, never do that. If you click in that box, you are allowing your micro tick to serve, to solve DNS that requires that come from outside. And that can be used for amplification attacks, DOS attacks for amplification of the DNS. And believe me, the majority of the DOS attacks are based on amplification, DNS amplification because of the micro ticks that selected this box. If you wish to select this box, please create a firewall rule whereby addresses outside your network can use the micro tick to solve IP addresses. So here, we're not going to select that. We're going to fill in the local DNS. And if we don't have the use one of a provider or Google's, and then we go to the IPv6 menu and D, the neighbor discovery part. And here we double click on all interface, all. Here we can create for the interface in PPOE, but it's not necessary to go to all the interfaces. Here we have one interface and we have to select these options, advertise, DNS, and click other configuration. This is anchored to, get to what Alejandro was explaining on NDP. So we're going to use the NDP to inform the CPE and to inform the host, which is the DNS address that we are using. Once we don't use GHCP for this, we use auto configuration stateless, which is based on router advertisement. Wesley. There are a couple of questions for you, Wesley. On the tunnel pool, if you use GUA addresses and if you don't check the DNS box, then the catch DNS won't work. If I don't select that box, allow remote request, the micro tick doesn't work as catch DNS. Yes, there's another question. In the micro tick in IPv6 settings, it should be configured with the correct marks in the settings in the show box. For example, routing and so on. Could you please comment on that? Yes. We're going to see that in the practice lab. Yes, here we have to have global unicast addresses because otherwise the client that connects with the computer will not have access to the internet. So this has to be include a global address by all means. And if you don't check this here, you won't have the catch of microtech. So if you do wish to do the catch, you have to do a 
have a high wall whereby addresses outside your network cannot have access so that these other addresses cannot access. So here we have the CPE of MicroTIC, which is super simple. The configuration is super simple. In IPv6, you have DHCPv6 client, and then you create a DHCP client. Now, when we speak about the, the, the pool, this is delivered through the DHCPv6 PG pool. So we have to create a DHCP client. We include whichever name we wish, and we're going to request a prefix. And then we'll receive a prefix. And we're also going to state the size of sub ranges of this initial pool. If we receive a slash 56, we say we're going to receive a 56, but it would range, will generate the six slash 64 ranges. So in order to announce these IPs in the internal domain, in the LAN forge or any micro tick that we use as CPE, then we're going to add the IPv6 address and we're going to only state from pool. So from which pool, which is a pool we created at the top in the DHCP client, so we're going to mention which is the pool from which we're going to obtain the addresses to deliver in the internal domain and which is the name of the interface. So here, we always have to select the option advertise. This is something we're going to see in the practical lab. And here we have the CP. PE of a TP link. We enable IPv6, connection type, username, password, get IPv6 address way, get IPv6 prefix delegation, and we assign this through Slack. And having done that, it works. So we follow the previous steps. And these steps here in the CPE, obviously, you already have to have all the documentation and the IPv6 uh, segment blocks defined and everything should be routed. So then it should work perfectly well. Now let us make a demo of how all this works. Here you have the QR code if you wish to download the virtual machine that we're going to use in this lab. If you don't have a QR reader, you can download it through this link here. You will have this on for five seconds in order to make a screenshot for our show. Laboratorio. So this lab is exactly the same as one of the labs that is available in the virtual machine in the links I gave you. So there you have a 464X Latch Lab 2. One of the other things that you can test out without being in production system in order to be sure how this works. Here we have the microtick concentrator. We have this switch here that sends a cable to our access point and then this is transmitted to the wireless clients and another cable and this device will be simulating the behavior of an olt that is bridged and only allows these two ftth clients to connect and then we have the two hosts and we're going to check if these hosts receive the ipv6 addresses assigned to these connections. So let us start. So let us start with a microtick concentrator, which has this address 192.168.200.210 slash 24. We're going to connect. And I'm in my concentrator now. I'm going to check this here. I have four connections. They have to do with the two clients I have and the two antennas. 
So let us check the setup of a PPOE server. Here we have an IP, the IPv6 address, the he corrects himself, the IPv6 pool, and then you have the DPD and then the tunnel pool. Here I included two slash 33 prefixes because this is just for the lab purposes. But here is where you have to have the documentation to know which is the prefix length that you require to have there in order to support Wesley. Um, they tell me, are you only sharing that screen? Maybe you should share the entire desktop. Let me close and start again. Yes. Okay. Can can you now see the microtech? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So once again, IPv6 pool, and here we have the pools that were set up. We have two slash 33 just for the purpose of the demo, but it is important to have the documentation in order to know which is the pool length that we are going to assign here so that it can support the amount of clients. Many people ask me, well, I have a slash 48 and I want X thousand of clients and now I get an error stating that I no longer have prefixes to give to my clients. Well, yes, that can happen. But before doing that, you have to do the documentation and specify there the adequate lengths of the prefixes that you want to deliver so that no client has has uh, remains without uh, without IPv6. So these are the prefixes that were used and we can see here those that were delivered to the connections established by the CPEs we have in our lab. Here in IP DNS we included the DNS addresses that we wish to deliver. In my case, I don't want to do allow remote requests because I'm delivering IPv6 addresses and I want the Google and Cloudflare client to directly check with Google. I don't want to do DNS cache. But if you wish to do cache, cache you have to click allow remote request and the fly firewall. Please do not forget the firewall so that you don't have an amplification DDoS attack. Here in IPv6 ND, we have the option of advertise DNS and other configuration. So this is all we need to deliver the DNS IPv6 to the clients. Just that, you don't need to do any other configuration to deliver IPv6. In the PPOE server, we have a simple PPO server. This is the service name, LACNIC, the interface, Ether1, and we here have the secrets. I just included one. That is why we have one, two, three, and zero in the connection. So what we're interested in is the assignment of the resources to our client. Here we have the local address IP, the remote address, which is this PPO EV4. This is a pool that I included here in the IP pool, and this contains the addresses of the RFC 6598. So these are private addresses to be used exclusively for CGNAT, because I don't have any public addresses here. And in the remote IPv6 prefix pool, we have the tunnel prefix that we created previously in IPv6 pool. Here we have the tunnel, which is the same prefix we have over here. And the DHCP, Wesley, could you please tell the colleagues that in this case, 
in order to optimize the speaker's time, we're going to leave the questions for Wesley for the end of his presentation. That's why we're not interrupting you right now. Thank you. And here in the remote DHCPD6 PD pool, we put the PD prefix. The rest of the configurations that you may want uh, to do, well, it all depends on your scenario, except for this one that needs to be used IPv6. Uh, yes, because if not, it won't deliver it. If you leave it as required, the required Required is a very interesting point because the, if the ISP doesn't have a IPv6 support, then uh, there won't be any uh, connection. So this can only be ticked if you are sure that all the uh, devices that uh, generate PPPoE uh, client devices have IPv6 support because it suffices with one. If one doesn't have it, then you won't uh, be able to connect and default don't ask me because now right now i wouldn't be able to tell you what would be the default uh, option so with this we finish this part of the ppboe and now we will access a, an ftdh uh, uh, client and uh, jose will talk about the uh, more precisely, and we are going to access this one just to see what the connection is like. So he has this FTTH1. The address is 192.168.200.210/24. So 200.210/24. Uh, PPPoE client in the pip. And here we have the menu already created, but if we were to create it, we have to put PPPoE client and we put the username and the password. You don't have to put too many things. And here, I would not use the add default route because if not, the uh, um, connection will crash because it, I, I don't need it. Uh, now for this demo, but the client needs it so that it may have an, uh, a default uh, uh, IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, so now what do we have in IPv6? We have an IPv6 address that's a slash 64 and it tells me from who PD, uh, ISP, PPPoE, what would that be? Well, that was the pool that was created automatically in the DHSP version client. And here, when we create this option requiring a prefix, and we say that the maximum length of the prefix is a slash 64, when we establish the PPPoE connection, automatically it captures and it gets filled. So we are going to mimic that to, to simulate that to see what happens when we disable it let's change the position of the screens so that you can see everything so here we have the pppoe connection that is established with our concentrator and we received a range and we have a pool. Ah, there's another thing. We also have the DNSs that were assigned automatically, IPv6 and IPv4. So let's leave the screen here and see what happens when we uh, disable the PPPoE. So you see that automatically the DNSs of IPv4 left we have a DNS of IPv6 that was not assigned directly by the NDP. And here in red, this means that this address is invalid. So let's go back to IPv6 address and we reconnect to see what happens. We reconnect and now you see it again in black and we, if we disable the IPv6 uh, 
client. Let's see what happens with IPv6. We disable and automatically you see that an error appears saying that this uh, pool of addresses does not exist because we, the pool was not created because it's not receiving anything because it's not active, it's not enabled. And if we enable it again, then it receives and you see that it gets enabled. It's no longer in red and we have an address again. This address slash 64 has this uh, option of advertise. This option means that this interface is capable of announcing NER IP addresses to IPv6 uh, uh, hosts requesting them. Let's see how it works. And here you see 200-200-32-772. Here, those that are going to uh, emulate when we take the the um the mouse uh, the, there you have the address so you can uh, access so here you have the ip of our emulator with uh, tcp 132.172 and here we go to the enc viewer 192.168.200.232.772 so there you see it. Please confirm, Jose. Yes, it's 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 opening. Wonderful. So here we open the user. By default, the user is in the manual that you'll find also in this folder that I shared, and then the password. Um, with a capital T and here we'll get into the virtual machine. It's loading. Let's see whether the loading gets completed or whether we have to load it again. Ready. Let's check the connections, the IP connections in this menu wired connected so it's it's connected through the wires and then let's see the wired settings in wired settings we are going to click on uh, the configuration to say to see what it says it says that we have an address 2001 db8 8900 what is this uh, address with 900? This 900 address is our slash 64 prefix. That is to up to 900, that's our prefix, the network indicator. And from 900 onwards, it's the host indication. That is our device, our computer received the IPv6 correctly. If this were a global IPv6, it receives IPv4 and a default route, etc. If it were a global IPv6 address, a public address, there we would have a connection to the internet with no problems whatsoever because the entire flow is established perfectly well seamlessly, that is from the concentrator where we assign the pool to the client that received the pool and to the router advertisement that we use here in the um, interface uh, uh, outbound. It could be a double uh, LAN one, or any, any my critique would work exactly the same, exactly the same. So a nice tip is testing the version the, that is uh, the current version before implementing it, because in some versions, the microtech may change a little thing here, a little thing there, and that may cause trouble. So if you, uh, when you listen to this tutorial again, please pay attention to that. 
let's check whether the commands and the options are all in the same place. Now we'll see Wi-Fi N that is with the end uh, 223, the ending 223. Ready? The very same thing. PPPOE is established. We have the connection that is established. It's running an IPv6 DHCP client. We are receiving a pool. Here you see that the other one was 900, but this one now is 100. So we started delivering from 8,000. So now it's 100 and 900. So let's see in the interface what the configuration is like. And you see that it's exactly the same as the previous one here. We see if we enable and disable this VHCP version six client automatically. Now it will remain in red. That's an error and here at the bottom, we also see there's an error and the address gets deleted. This is to prevent any errors because if there are any addresses here in this field with the advertise uh, option, then the Microtik will deliver it to whoever requests it. So automatically everything gets deleted if we establish the DHC. CP version client, we see that MyCritic uh, does it on its own. Why did we uh, conduct this test, enabling and disabling the PPPoE client and then enabling it again? Because in some previous versions of MyCritic, when the PPPoE crashed, the configuration of IPv6 got frozen. So it wouldn't update and you had to um, uh, reboot uh, the micro ticks so that you would uh, be able to allocate the new delivery ranges to the clients. But now it already works perfectly well with no problems. And here we can check this that is with the 32769 as a port. Okay, so test one, two, three with a capital T for test. Let's wait until it gets loaded. Listo. Ready. In the network configurations again, we are going to wired setting and now we'll see that again we have ipv6 that was configured and it's ready and it's fully operational as in the previous machine with this configuration that we just completed any device with ipv6 support in the customer's home will have ipv6 connection because we are using the router advertisement, this option. And this is what ensures that uh, through NP, you can deliver the IP information, the uh, uh, everything, all the information is delivered and all the devices will have support. They will have IPv6 connection ready. We still have a few minutes late uh, left. So we'll have time for questions. Good. I, I can help you with the questions. I'd be very happy to do that. Pagliero, Guillermo Pagliero is asking about the pros and cons of of assigning Slack uh, with, in contrast with the uh, HTTP with a delegated prefix? That's a very good question. 
in the segment between ISP and the client, you always need to have a two, Slack and DHCP with a delegate. If it's Slack, we'll give you the tunnel a slash 64 and DHCP with delegate with a delegated prefix will give you a prefix so that you can use in the internal domain. Now, if you use the DHCP version six in the internal domain in the customer, so maybe a smartphone that doesn't have a the uh, DHCP version six a smartphone won't work, while Slack or almost guarantees uh, that it will work in all the devices, even in IoT devices. They don't even have DHCP version client because you want more things, more codes, more functions. In the meantime, uh, while Slack will work perfectly well, so most IoT devices don't even have the support. Siempre Slack in the dominio interno. So always Slack in the internal domain while between the provider, the SP, and the CP of the subscriber, this had to be delivered to DHCP because you're delivering ranges and not addresses. I have another question regarding micro tick in IPv6 settings, which would be the correct configuration of the one you recommend from your standpoint? Well, allow me to share this once again, the screen. In my configurations, I do not touch this at all here. I leave this exactly the way it is by default. I have never touched these, never changed these, and it has always worked. So if you don't need to touch this, just don't touch it. But for example, if we want to, if we have 2,000 clients and we only want 2,000 CPEs to be in the tables in the neighbor tables, well, this is a more advanced type of configuration, but it's not necessary for you to do this. Another question here, Marcelo Sosa. Thank you very much for your question. If I try to connect a virtual machine with an adapter Wi-Fi in bridge node and it doesn't pick it up, is it necessary to do this through a cabled network? The virtual network that you downloaded well i wouldn't know because i only use it with a wired network i have all my accesses here this lan is directly through my cable so it might be that nevertheless it will also be available there i can be around if and you can contact me directly and you have my email address so you can write to me directly and we'll be happy to help you. We have another question here from Hermes Quintero. In the previous exercise, he used GNS3. Now they use EVENG. What would you recommend for the simulations? GNS3 or this new version EVENG? Well, any of the two will help you, whichever you I'll feel more comfortable with, that would be the best version for you, both EVE and G, as well as GNS3, and even the other one, the newest one, which is Fennet Lab. I already have very long laboratories set up with this, with 128 RAM, and it's the lab is almost full, and I'm doing capacity testing. So the three work super well. Some functions, sorry, of the EVENG will be like you have some that you don't have in GNS3, for example, the cable with the device that is turned on. So you have to turn off the device to access it. But in GNS3, you can connect the cable with the device on. And the other one, Finet Lab, you can also do that. Only Eve has that issue of the pro version which is a paid one you can connect the cables with the device on but any of the three can be well served from the simulator so let me summarize two questions and one when you showed the ip configuration of the pc you 
didn't see the default port. Is that so? And in your opinion, what is the maximum number of concurring sessions in PPOE that could be supported in the microtick? Well, here in this host, IP show. All right. Here we have the IP. IP route show. And in fact, this has not been assigned. This hasn't been assigned. So something happened with this virtual machine that it hasn't been assigned. But it has the entire configurations. So I really don't know what happened here. I'll have to check this and we have to update it in the manual. So thanks for the information. I really was not aware of this. Excellent. Someone is commenting that if this doesn't work with Wi-Fi, if the virtual box well, those would summarize the questions we received here. Yes, there was one that I did not answer, which is the concurrent PPOE sessions. Well, this will depend on the hardware you're going to use and which are the additional functions that you're going to have in your hardware. For example, you can have a CCR 1033 that only supports 800 or 1,000 clients simultaneously. And if you have a firewall, you have the same CCR with three or 4,000 sessions if you don't do NAT, if you have the fast path native, or if you don't do firewalls. So this will largely depend on the status of the micro ticks. So we have that difference in capacity for those reasons. Great. We have another question. Can you do a load balance in IPv4, IPv6 simultaneously? In Microtik? Well, I never tried that. In IPv4, yes, and it works. But with IPv6, I never tried load balance. But the principle of load balance is marking packets. We can check here in the IPv6. So you can select the packets, and it's probably that in the IPv6 route list, here doesn't have it. No, no, you cannot assign a route by default in IPv6 with a packet marking, at least in this version that I have here, which is version 642. So this, I think, is not yet possible, but MicroSIC is something that will be enabling in future versions. Wesley. Someone is asking any information on the update of the RFC 48 for Microtix? I wouldn't know. I, would, I don't know anything. I would have to check in the forum what it, they say here. I have no information on updates. All right, those would be the questions. Do you have anything else there? No, everything's fine. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jose Cutua. I was already introduced by Alejandro Costa and Wesley Correa, who uh, uh, were the first speakers. They talked about uh, all the aspects uh, related to uh, neighbor discovery and uh, the configuration of microtics and the PPPOE uh, processes, which is one of the key processes for providing service to clients. In my case, I was asked uh, to speak uh, of uh, the GPON uh, uh, network, uh, the GPON uh, that uh, is a uh, growing, although it's almost uh, 20 years uh, old since it was initially implemented. And without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. 
It's important for the implementation of IPv6. I understand that when I share it, uh, you don't see it. Uh, Alejandro, are you there? Could you tell me if uh, you can see it? Yes. Alejandro, can you see the screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Could you please let me know that you can hear me and see the screen? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the screen. Good. So, let's uh, start. I prepared a material that has to do with uh, the GPON technology as a network of, to access uh, for uh, our mass uh, uh, networks. So this is my contact information. If you have any questions, my email and this is my personal email. I'm going to speak of four aspects. First of all, I'm going to devote a couple of minutes to discuss the uh, rational and uh, the uh, operation aspects and to give you a context of uh, the reference framework. This is a technology that has a lot of technical details. It is very it because it touches upon many details such as uh, networks of access uh, in depth. But at least I'm going to give you some uh, ideas uh, so that you can understand the things. The, then I'm going to speak of the OLT, how to configure it, that is the main unit for access uh, for GPON, uh, especially focusing on uh, IPv6. Then I'm going to speak of how you configure the uh, uh, CV of uh, the client, and then I'm going to give you a demo of how to configure GP, GPON with IPv6, especially with I high-speed internet service. So the GPON technology was um, uh, already introduced uh, in the early 2000s. It's a um, uh, standard of uh, uh, ITT that solves many constraints of uh, the previous technologies, such as the uh, copper pair uh, access uh, or and commercially, it became available in uh, the in 2006, uh, 2005, 2006, and today there are three big standards: the traditional GPON, the so-called GPON, with uh, a, a five uh, gig up for access, uh, and we can um, connect uh, up to 128 clients. Until eight years ago, that was the maximum capacity for GPON. Now, in 2012, they introduced a new standard that is the 10G GPON, both in symmetric and asymmetric configuration with 10 giga per port. So you may have up to 256 ports. So you see um, that it has a much broader capacity. And in 2016, they introduced a new standard that is called the 40. Uh, GPON, and you may have up to 60 gigabits per port through multiplexing of uh, several bands of 10 giga. So the technology has evolved very quickly in two decades, and today there are no access technologies with uh, that delivers a, a good uh, speed. Um, and from the point of view of its architecture, GPON is a network access that uh, has three key aspects. The so first of them is the active elements that can uh, that have the switching and routing and logic connection uh, capacities. Those are the OLTs or the ONTs. Um, this is a point to multipoint. Uh, an OLT, an optical line terminator, can manage several um, PEs through an optic multiplexing. Then we have the passive optical splitter, 
Uh, that we have the optical distribution network that is the ODN that takes the fiber from the OLT to the end user. That network may be very complex because it has to go through the city until it reaches the, the end uh, user. And finally, we have the uh, uh, transport network and uh, that uh, uh, provides the uh, uh, services. So GPON was, uh, was designed so that it would be transparent, but it has been incorporated routing functions and in some cases of uh, bandwidth control. In the bandwidth control of the OLT and in the routing of the ONTs today, uh, now the ONTs have a routing role. In the past, they were switches, but now they are a sort of a game switch for the uh, clients. And the OLT, although it's sophisticated and it has routing uh, roles, it is it, it acts as a switch. The idea is that it should be transparent. There you have uh, the nomenclature of what are the ports, for instance, of the ONTs that go to the uh, passive optic split. Uh, uh, and the ONT can provide Ethernet, uh, Wi Fi, wireless in all its modalities, uh, telephone services. And that was that's why GPON is a technology that is very popular for providing uh, services to end users. From the technical point of view, the fiber optic used by GPON has one single thread to optimize and reduce the investment in fibers. And it's because of that, that GPON needs to use the uh, double, uh, WDM um, uh, technique so that it can uh, transmit uh, upstream and downstream. They use two lambdas, one uh, for downstream, uh, um, uh, transmission and the other for upstream uh, transmission. So you have a multiplexing port in both sides, in both ways. The other topic has to do with the control of the access uh, uh, or the transmissions, because downstream, the OLT port transmits and it receives a hundred, uh, 64 or 128 units, ONT units, and that is done through the broadcast technique with, uh, that identifies the traffic. So the OLT transmitter, then uh, it, and then it uh, multiplexes depending on the identifier. GPON is uh, uh, capsulating um, um, uh, technology that uses the GTC structures that are convergence structures. GPON is, was also a thought for encapsulating um, uh, even uh, uh, MPS uh, traffic. So downstream, there's not much to say, but all the traffic is controlled by the OLT. Now upstream there, as it transmits 64, 128 and receives one, there should be a technique to organize the traffic. The upstream traffic is worked with a technology that doesn't belong to GPON, but it's used by GPON. That is uh, the uh, TDMA and OLT assigns uh, time spaces so that each OLT may transmit that TDMA may is related to the uh, bandwidth. It's, this is a very technical <laughs> element. I don't want to discuss it in detail, but I just uh, wanted to tell you what the concept is. GPON is a technology that solves many problems. Not only can it be used uh, for uh, home users, but for household users, but it can uh, solve uh, interconnection problems in different scenarios. That's why you're going to see the concept of FTTX that encompasses a number of possibilities, such as FTTH that the is fiber to the whatever. In the case of 
FTTH is fiber to the home. That is, you take the fiber to the uh, client's home, but you can take it to the border, to the uh, building, and the last mile can be finished with a copper uh, cable or, or, or different technologies. You can also use it for mobile with a radio base in the case of FTTM or transport E1s. And it's not used so much now for that purpose, but it gives you that possibility. And an interesting possibility is to change with fiber the points of access in public places, in stadiums or in parks. So this is a technology that complements other technologies or the other way around. Other technologies complement what GPON cannot do. So those are the FTTP uh, configuration scenarios. Here you see a different view. So here you have FTTB, FTTO, FTTH. GPON offers all those possibilities, a very comprehensive technology. Now, getting into the technical things, as this is an optic transmission, there is a system for multiplexing the services, both upstream and downstream. An interesting characteristic of GPON is that it works uh, in a way uh, uh, downstream and in another, a different way in the upstream. That is from the CT to the OLT and from the OLT to the CT. In the downstream, you, you can use a multicast uh, thread because it can deploy on IP and, but not upstream. So what GPON does is that from the port, they create a number of threads of services that are called gem ports or generic encapsulation so that an OLT in a pond port may have tens or hundreds of multiplexed uh, services through a downstream scheme and an upstream scheme. So upstream, there's a peculiarity and it is that as it's a uh, a TDMA uh, system, you need to define the bandwidth based on that. So you have then uh, a system that is called the dynamic um, uh, allocation system that assigns a number of uh, um, bandwidth schemes. So when you configure an ONT, you have to define the bandwidth of the upstream uh, way. Just so that we know how the downstream is, there is the GPON packets that are follow GGC frame, and each frame determines which it, it it corresponds. This is how it is upstream, uh, downstream. Now, a couple of other things that distinguish GPON from previous techniques such as DOCSIS and TLS. First of all, the capacity. As you saw, GPON has a high traffic capacity, at least 2.5 gigabits per second. It's 2,500 megabits. And then we have 10 megabits per port, and now we have up to 40 or 60. Compared to these, the coaxial copper, in the case of coaxial with DOCSIS, it's 10 gigabits. And with DOCSIS 4.0, the standard is about to come out. The possibility will be 40 gigabits. But this is for 1,000 subscribers at the most. Another important feature of GPON is the, dis the capacity at a distance. Even more than 20 kilometers, will then this will depend on the configuration of each port. And in DOCSIS, it's just a few meters one, two or three kilometers. So in that sense, GPON is better. And the other element 
in order to finish this comparison is that Tripon has important features in terms of quality of service from the subscriber. From the moment traffic enters the CPE, we already note quality of service issues that are better. And this offers the opportunity of offering different types of services to the subscribers. Now, in this situation, which are the key issues of this technology? And now I would like to describe the configuration process of the OLT, which is the central access unit of GPON, particularly to configure an internet service in this space. So I will only speak about the internet services. We have to make a couple of additional consider considerations for the voice services or for VP services. As regards the configuration of the OLT, in GPON, the OLT controls absolutely everything, each of the subscribers, the access, the bandwidth, and the VLAN where these are located, all the in layer two architecture and the layer three architecture. So this is a very sophisticated equipment. And OLT has a capacity from very small, 100, 200, 3,000, 400, another in a very few units, they can manage up to 64,000 subscribers. And whenever, as time goes by, even more. So this in a device that occupies one third of the rack can cover 64, 65,000 subscribers, which is quite important. And this was not possible in previous, with previous technologies. So as regards the entire GPON network, the previous speaker, Wesley, spoke about provisioning of the access router from the standpoint of the PPOE. We must say that that is not the only way of provisioning the IP addresses of the CPEs. You can also do this with HCP and also with delegated prefixes. But the top layer network has a couple of considerations that you have to take into account. If you want to have a full IPv6 transition, Okay, here I'm back. So the DNS servers, the NTP servers, and also for backup uh, purposes, user authentication such as triple, triple A or radios and register the commands, the network management servers, all these can do the transition to IPv6, and we have to consider the dynamic routing as well, or the static to the top layer levels. For example, they can support IVGP with route reflector, or MPLS, 60E, and some sophisticated mechanisms. And the OLT is also an important issue. So IPv6 reaches the OLT and the ONT as well in all the aspects. So I will only speak about the prefix delegation part. Wesley already referred to this, but I'm going to add a few considerations. Then the ND, the RA. Remember that in this case, the RA is very important from the standpoint of the access router. This allows to provide provisioning of the addresses, and I will explain this in a while. As regard the active components, if I wish to configure a GPON network with IPv6, I have to have the GLP and the CPE, the OLT and the CPE. The two have to coincide, the CPE and ONT, in the sense of the VLAN, so bandwidth, and so on. The passive GPON network is not configured. It is simply does the optical transport. 
a couple of initial considerations. The top layer router can be uh, Microtik, uh, Huawei, and so on. But we have to bear in mind that you always have to do provisioning of the CPA for the LAN under one interfaces. In IPv6, you don't have private addresses. You have to, this is something new. And in principle, this led to a couple of issues that I will be referring to, but many of these things have been solved in the meantime. I will be working with a micro tick, but I want you to have the idea of the topics that have to be solved and the decisions you have to make. One of the issues that is widely discussed has to do with the prefix size that I delegate to the CPEs. The answer to this question is that in no case a slash 64, in no case less than a slash 60, and whatever delegation between slash 48 and slash 60 will be fine, but I tend to do a slash 48. Many people say these are a lot of prefixes, but they have a couple of issues related to optimizing the routing tables with optimizing routing and then not having to do reassignments to the users and to be in line with the LACNIC policies that end users are assigned in slash 48. So if you're assigned a slash 32 as an ISP, you have 65,000 plus slash 48 and if you have more clients than that, you can perfectly well ask for an additional slash 32 and continue having a slash 48. So it is not correct to say that if I assign a slash 48, I will run out of IPs. You will not run out of IPs. And if the assignment, uh, you run out of that, you can ask for an additional block and you won't have any problems. For example, I'm working with a slash 36 prefix to assign a slash 48. And this gives me the capacity of about 4,000 possible prefixes can be, uh, and that capacity can be delegated. Other options, slash 48, slash 60, slash 40, for fours, for 46, 36, for slash 48, but not less than slash 60 and never slash 64 for the client. Give the client as much IPv6 as possible in order to have more flexibility. Remember that right now they just have one LAN, but later on they, will have a, they can have a very large network and that would be the situation in the future. In the case of MicroTix, Wesley referred to this already, but let me add a couple of concepts. MicroTick already includes activated IPv6, and if that is not the case, then you have to activate it. And in the case of the settings, I personally recommend to state that the MicroTick should not accept router advertisements. I like to protect it because otherwise all the IPv6 configuration would be static because that is a router it's the access router so i think it is a good practice to disable router advertisement so as not to receive an announcement of an ra and then you have the possibility of accepting it and then you can run a risk an important thing regarding GPON and going into practical considerations is that everything is done through VLANs. So we'll have to create a VLAN and assign the IPv6 issues there. IPv6 addressing of any microtic interface is activated, it has an RA enabled by default. This is for uh, uh, sending. Now, in the network, you have to activate the RA. I would now like to go directly into the configuration. I will do this directly on a MicroTik router. All right, there you see my screen. So first of all, the VLANs, here you have the VLANs. 
I'm going to have a VLAN with a GPON network. It's a 410. So that's going to be the internet VLAN for this case of the internet service that I get from GPON. On that VLAN, I will create the IP address, the one I have here, which is a GOEA. I'm now working in a production environment that an ISP from Mexico give us uh, the people from Satlink, and they have deployed IPv6. So I'd like to thank them for giving me access to one of the microtics and one of the OLTs for the purpose of this live demo. So in the VLAN 410, I have the GUA. It's always a slash 64. I always recommend that. And always with slash 64 then. And see here, the advertise is enabled in order to uh, enable the RA. So the microtech is going to announce this for Slack and is the link, the entry link. In the ND part in that VLAN, I can set this and include the time parameters for the RA. I can do that here. Normally, this works fine with the default values. I like to lower these times personally. And very important, advertise the MAC address so that people can optimize the process and so that the clients know that they don't have to resolve the MAC address. And then other highlight, select other configurations. And in his case, I don't advertise DNS because I'm advertising this to the DHCP. And I'm going to show you this. Anuncia perfectamente. But the MicroTrick RA announces the DNS. So once I activate this RA in that interface, which is enabled by default, but I like to do this in a differentiated way in order to establish the parameters for each interface. So then I see here the announced prefix when I configure the IP. So the MyTropic is through RA announcing the configured prefix. In addition, the DNS issue, an interesting thing about MicroTik that is quite striking is that it, it announces as an IPv6 in RA, it takes it from the IPv4 manual. Here I'm placing one that already has the satellite, and here I put two DNSs of Google, uh, two, I can put two of uh, my own domain, I recommend the DNS to be one of the points where we can add, you can advance in IPv6, but it is in this uh, direction. Although it's in the IPv4 menu, the RA takes uh, the, uh, from the DNS from here. I'm announcing this inside of the DHCCP and the, the delegator. Basically, what we did here was to create a pool I'm announcing it as the delegation. It says that the delegation is 36 to 48. That is a pool of 36 to 48. That is 4,000 prefixes, each of slash 48. But in addition to that, in the DHCP, in the options, I put the DNS. And the DNSs have to be put as options and with hexadecimal here. IPv6, DHCP server, even if it doesn't say DHCP, the MicroTik is a delegator. It's a DHCP server with delegation, although it might not say it. Here I put the DNSs, and then what I do is that in the server, I tell, here I have the active server, uh, in uh, VLAN 410, and here I say uh, I want uh, the delegated uh, prefixes to be transmitted. So it's going to give a slash 48, and the D it's going to send the DNS. In this case, I'm doing it with DHCP and with the DNS uh, VLAN of DHCP. This is 
with respect microtic. So that needs to be done, be it microtic or, or any other router. So from that microtic, I'm now I'm going to to see the configuration of OLT very quickly. You need to start from the following. OLT has routing functions, but normally it is configured for the layer two mode. So, it, and it has the capacity of villain switching with high performance uh, capacity for control of bandwidth. As a matter of fact, when you create the services, they're created with control of bandwidth. And the, in the recent OLTs, I'm using a, an OLT of Huawei, the model 5800X2, and it is respected by almost all the OLT. OLTs. The commands may differ, but the philosophy is the same. What do I consider about the OLT with IPv6? First of all, that it should, we, we need to configure an address. I can send the locks to a remote lock server with the IPv6. I can identify with a radius. That is, all the IP processes I, partic I recommend to transition to IPv6 so that you can start diving into IPv6. So although, although it's not a router, it may be helpful. An interesting thing about this OLT is that IPv6 is all, comes already enabled. Now, in, in the past, you had to enable it, but now, now when you start creating interfaces, because here everything is VLAN-based, those interfaces, you need to enable IPv6. So if you want to give a look back, you have to enter the look back, enable IPv6, and you even have to activate the uh, address, the autolink local, and then assign the IP. For instance, the OLTs, in addition, have an interface dedicated to management. I can configure an IP address, and there I would have to configure a link uh, local address, an LLA. I can also add the static routing, not for the exercises, but for services. And from then on, we have the process. One of the characteristics that the OLT has is that it can distinguish when the traffic is IPv6 and when it is not and create the service threads based on that. After configuring it, the first thing that you do is to create the VLANs of the services so that all the traffic uh, lands in those and the VLANs have to be associated to ports that is the concept of the port VLAN. So this is a command, OLT is a command that, in, that allows you to do that. And the VLANs in GPON have a segmented behavior. It's segmented because I can, they are isolated. And I can break that isolation with bridges, with uh, special profiles. This is the typical configuration of a VLAN in the OLT mode. By, de by default, it is layer two, and I have to raise it to layer three. I have, I create a v VLAN IF, and then I, um, uh, I enable IPv6. And an important thing that you need to remember is that the RA of the interfaces of the OLT that have IPv6 version, they are enabled by default. So as I have an RA in the microtech, the idea is to disable the RA in the IPv6 OLT interfaces, and that is done with NDRA hold. So 
because if not, I'm going to have two RAs and they may clash. The ports upstream are one switcher ports. I have, I can activate some uh, special uh, ports. So, well, we're going to leave that for, for the end. And another important thing is the bandwidth that they are defined by the traffic profiles. I create the bandwidth that I need to provide to the services. Remember that in these configurations, except for the VLANs, I haven't uh, talked about IPv6 yet because uh, the OLT basically is a switch. Then I create the entire structure of transportation of the GPON um, services. And those are three big things. The VA uh, profiles that uh, I can uh, modulate the uh, upstream uh, bandwidth for certain services, then I have the service profile that enables me to state how the OLT is going to behave with the ports. Then the line profiles, uh, all the GPON line can be is modulated, defining exactly the service threads that I will have. And those structures are finally represented by the uh, gem ports. Here you have the gem ports. Once I have all my profile structures, I go to the port where I have the OLT, I activate the laser and the OLT is capable of discovering the OLTs that are in line so as to incorporate them to the OLTs database. This is the SNMP part. In SNMP, the traps can be sent through IPv6 version. I think it's a, I recommend you to do that. So that is uh, to do everything in IPv6 rather than IPv4. Then send log to a remote uh, server is in uh, IPv6. And then you have the part of adding the OLT to the ONT. You have to be very, very explicit. But we have to say the port, the series, uh, the OLT that I'm going to ass assign and the profiles. I'm going a bit faster so that we can get to the hands-on. An interesting part is that once you have everything ready, you create the services. The service is the consolidation to provide continuity to the different uh, IPv6 traffic uh, uh, and IPv4 that I have, basically. There, I tell them uh, the bandwidth that I have, 500 mega, the VLAN the service brings in, uh, um, uh, in the port where it is, and, and I consolidate everything and I cre create the continuity of the service. An interesting part of the services is that I can even create, we didn't do it here, but we can create um, service threads or IPv6 only or IPv4 only, or I can even segment the traffic if you want to deal with it differently, the uh, types of traffic. And um, um, if it's unified, uh, then it is not necessary. But we are going to see three charts that illustrate the deployment of the service in the ONT. And then I'll show you how it is done. In the ONT, I can provide service, a port-based service. Basically, what I need to do is to allow the flow coming from the client in an ONT to go to the GPOM uh, service thread that is done through gem mappings that are created within uh, uh, GPOM. In this case, the ONT is behaving as a switch. I can also maintain the same behavior, uh, but through the traffic tagging and I, and the traffic then comes with a VLAN from the OLT. And the way this is updated now, although it can be updated in layer three, now it's used in layer three. So you put a router in the OLT that receives the traffic of the client and, and routes the traffic using the 
Jan 14th. And I have to implement IPv6 here, IPv6 here. That's why the delegate prefix that I have to give IPv6 to the client. So this router plays an important role looking for the prefixes, providing the one, the LAN, and, and then doing the R8 with the clients. And I'm going to show the process later. The OLT is a CP equipment that provides services of different natures. I can give internet in one port, IPTB in another port, or telephone, or even analog um, uh, telephone. So uh, this is a very sophisticated service that enables you to provide different services depending on the customer's requirements, depending on whether the service wants interconnection or whatever. So looking at the interconnection globally, basically you need to ensure that all the client's traffic may be in routed in the ONT. It goes through the threads of GPON and they end up landing in, um, uh, um, in here in the OLT, and this shows the continuity of service of GPON in all the uh, settings. So I'm going to show you a connection, a live connection. Now I'm going to, I'm going to start with the ONT, that is the client's machine. And I'm going to show you what the configuration would be for IPv6. I'm going to do it in this case, I'm going to do it in dual stack. In, um, in ONT, the same as in many CMP, although a lot of progress has been done with the evolution with the slash 64, et cetera, in my view, the CP still, that something is missing. For instance, these uh, CPs don't have 464 um, NAT, but uh, so the newest versions still would uh, need uh, to evolve a little bit more. This is the ONT and the IPv6 configuration. It's very simple. You have to take into account three or four aspects. First of all, in the ONT, you have to create the one interface that I mentioned earlier. Remember, I said that the ONT, I'm creating this concept here. So that interface doesn't come already created. And the parameters of that interface have to do with connectivity. First of all, if I'm to work with encapsulated traffic on IPPoE or IPoE. So remember, I can provision the, this with IPoE, as Wesley explained. I'm not going to speak about that. I'm going to do it from the standpoint of DHCP so that you see the other side. It's the same concept, but with another protocol. And this would be IPOE. This interface is already configured. This CPE, I can select whether I want it only IP4, IPv6, or dual stack. So I here have dual stack for the reason I explained that it doesn't have sophisticated transition mechanisms. I explained this. So the client still has IPv4, although the client can activate IPv6 and have IPv4. Uh, 464XLAT. This is a routed mode. I activate VLAN. This is a VLAN for the WAN. This has to be smaller in the OLT. I indicate the ports I want to route. So they provide internet services to all the ports, and one is for in wireless networks. And here, the IPv6 part. So there are two things always. First, the prefixes I have of the LAN side and how I configure the IP on the WAN side. I can have static prefixes. I can obtain these through the DHCP and that 
there is where I configure the microtick. And then as a, uh, because I will be obtaining the IP automatically, DHCP is for the prefixes only, but in IPv6, I recommend using the RA method. This for what I explained earlier. And there's a variant whereby I can get one of the delegated prefixes to configure these in the one. This is not used very much, but it's possible. So that is what I do in the interface. When I do that, the WAN does a transaction. Jose, the other ones are for other services. The WAN obtains an IP address through RA, and you will note that this coincides with the prefix of the address I mentioned earlier, which is this one under VLAN 410. So this IP you have here was obtained through RA, in other words, through Slack. This is the automatic link, and here you have the delegation. The delegator gave it a slash 48. So I say now, what will happen that that slash 48? So I have to go to IPv6 and then tell the system to first, which will be the routing to the internet. In other words, through where the CPE does the internet traffic. And I say, you're going to do this interface in this part, IPv6, default route. And I have to do this because there can be several interfaces. And then I have to tell it how it will do provisioning of the LAN network. So I tell it to take the prefixes from the delegated prefixes I obtained in the LAN one. And I can even set a mask to indicate which is the prefix it's going to use. Slash 48 are thousands of prefixes, but I can say exactly the one I wish to configure. And then where it gets the DNS from and how it's going to go on. So as a result, the result of all this is that Now I have to go to the PC, and I'm connected through Wi-Fi. So here I have the prefixes. This is the same prefix I received. The prefix was up to here. And the PC takes the prefix announced by the CPE with RA and with DHCCP, and it is configured with the IP address, which is the one we have here. The gateway is configured. So this is an, an interesting thing, is that the gateway is still in the link local address. It took the D, up the DNS. There you have the DNS. And for testing purposes, the PC has internet. Let's do a test here. Let's test it. And here, the PC has its IPv6 version. It's the one we have over here, the same one. The one we saw over here is the one we see up here. And an interesting detail, which I recommend, when you're testing IPv6 on the PC side, a PC you can do this on a smartphone too. And what I recommend is installing this packet called IPVFOO. This allows you to see which are the IP addresses that are seen in that page. If I go to what is my IP, I have the IPv4 and IPv6 versions. And here I'm doing ping to Google's DNS trace without any problem. And I have even done some speed tests. This works only in IPv6. This one is in Asia. It's 50 mega, mega. And to really test whether my connection is good, one of the things I like to do about this is 
it is almost full in IPv6. So I like to download this file and I will check that I have a good bandwidth. Jose, can you hear us? Jose? So I'm going to see this in the microtech. In the microtech, if I go to the interface, the VLAN 410, which is the one I have here. So I can do a torch and I can validate whether the device, so I can see the traffic. I 102 megabits of that traffic is in IPv6. I wonder if you can see it there. 106 mega, I have even had 300 mega. So that's a good way of doing this. So I'm showing that it is perfectly way to use GPON in version six. And I um, have a lot of width up there. Están todos tentados. Vale, José, ¿cómo estás? Jose, I was here. Can you hear me, Jose? Can you hear me? Hola, hola, hola. Hello, Jose. Hola, hola. Okay, ahí me están escuchando. Hola, Jose. Ajá. No sé cuántos minutos me quedan, Alejandro. Sí. Bueno. How many more minutes do I have, Alejandro? Well, you are, you run out of time. We, we. I wanted to. Can you help me with the questions? Yes. I tried to make a great effort to convey as much information as possible in one hour. I apologize if I was too fast. In, in fact, that was great. Yes, that was great, Jose. I trust that this presentation will support a lot of people in the deployment of IPv6 in the GPON networks. Hopefully that is the case. Time will tell. That was great. Now, Jose, I have three questions. Try to answer the questions very briefly, in less than, less than 30 seconds. Can you repeat this? Okay. I have three questions for you. Try to answer the questions in less than 30 seconds, please. The first question is from Wilmar Hives. Is it possible to use an emulator just such as GNS3 or EVE to do GPON laboratories? No. The answer is no. One, giving you 1%, you can imagine. But the answer to that question of saying no is because the OLTs are very sophisticated devices, very complex devices. I have done quite a lot of sim great simplification here, but these devices are not yet available for doing tests. I understand that there are some special emulators, but not with this option. So there is still a, some way to go. Thank you for your answer. The second question, very briefly, the GPON technology, is this going to benefit homes in terms of internet bandwidth and what percentage of the bandwidth does it guarantee? Particularly now in times of the pandemic where the bandwidth becomes saturated. Well, that's a wonderful question, an excellent question. Because with GPON, we are going in to go into the real era of bandwidth consumption with GPON, and this already happens, this operator in Mexico, for example, is already offering 500 mega plans, one giga, 300 megas. So this is going to be a quantum change. The issue of congestion will be more on based on the fact that the operator will have the required bandwidth in the upstream, because now they'll have the possibility of having access to great bandwidth with GPON. GPON won't have any limits. The limit will be in the upper layers of the connection towards the internet providers. So yes, a strong change in terms of bandwidth consumption is coming up. 
as Gpon starts to enter. Okay, Jose. Well, I, the last question is something that can be answered by email. So I asked the participant to write to you directly to your email address so that he can contact you and to see something about the hexadecimals and so on. So he will send you an email. Yes, please feel free to contact me. You have my email address there uh, in the case of this question or any other questions. Yes, the DNS is in the DHCP of Microtik is done in hexadecimal. Okay, I'd love to be there in a face to face meeting to give Wesley and Jose a big round of applause. The time is very valuable. I really appreciate their having been with us today and sharing their knowledge with us, which is something we really appreciate. Finally, please don't leave. We have some time still sponsored by the people of Nick BR, who always work closely with LACNIC. They are at our events, so I wanted to share the screen.